This week on the Computer Chronicles, part two of our special series on computer technology at the Olympics. What would you do if 7,000 PCs showed up at your office and you had to configure them all for hundreds of different uses? We'll show you how it was done. Did you follow some of the Olympic results on the web? We'll show you the huge information systems that fed the internet. When your network has to be 100% reliable, you need lots of redundancy. We'll show you how they bulletproof the IT systems at the Olympics. Did you watch the hockey games? We'll show you the complex software systems that were used to document every single moment of each game. And computers also help the athletes go faster. We'll show you how Nike used technology to help the U.S. speed skating team. Part two of our series on computers at the Olympics, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite, one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by PC to PC, the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one. The sheer size of the Olympics makes you wonder how they ever did an event like this before computers. Consider the dimensions of the IT operation here. 225 servers, 145 Linux boxes, 32,000 miles of fiber put down, 4,500 workstations, PCs and laptops, 17,000 cell phones and two-way radios, 40 custom software applications representing more than 10 million lines of code. The principal desktop operating system used at the Olympics was Windows NT. The platform that we're running is NT, and uh, when the decision was made uh, several years ago, at least two years ago, NT was the most stable system that was available at that time, so we use NT. Some of the laptops uh, for their particular configuration and images run Windows 98, so that, that's basically the, the main operating system, the central servers that we have do run, they're Sun servers and they run Unix systems. The OS strategy is going to change for the next Summer Olympics in Athens. Greece has, has decided to use um, Windows 2000, uh, which is a good decision because it's, it was built off of NT and uh, Windows XP is really early on the market right now and they didn't want to you know use a, a brand new operating system so Greece will use uh, Windows 2000. Managing the 40 or so different custom software applications here was a nightmare because every venue and virtually every user required a unique set of applications called a software image. We have um, 116 different images for the games and the images are basically pro programmed at um, the headquarters and then they're transferred down here over phone lines to a central server and then the central server holds all of the images. Now we directly, we have our own network in the PC factory and we directly hook up to that server, put in a request for the operating system for that particular machine, it's loaded on the machine then packaged up and sent out to the individual venues. The applications were a mix of off-the-shelf programs and the customized software applications put together by Schlumberger Sema. The two predominant applications are what's called OVR, on-venue results, because they want to know exactly who's come down the slopes, who's, what the times were, and where they stand in the places. Um, the other information system that's predominant and used on the profiles, the touch screens, is the, the CIS system, which is basically the uh, commentator information system used for the um, thousands of newscasters that'll be here over the Olympics. Here in this unmarked warehouse on the edge of town at what was called the PC factory, technicians had the job of loading the custom software images onto some 7,000 computers. Imagine the task of keeping track of thousands of computers, some 50 applications to be distributed to 11 venues covering 15 different sports. The solution was a barcode system that not only identified each PC, but also automatically generated the appropriate software applications from the server. Attached to the server are several switches throughout the PC factory, and each one of those switches has a scanner. So every PC is labeled with a venue name, which is three characters, uh, uh, image name, which is six characters, and then a number as to what it is in that particular venue. 
when the machines are brought up here, they're directly connected to the server. And then the, um, the image that's going to be on that machine is scanned via scanners, and the system automatically loads to that particular machine. Each application image was represented by a six-letter code, and the technicians could drill down on any code to see what the applications in that image were and what modifications or add-ons might be needed to enable those programs. This was certainly gateway country in Utah. All the computers were provided by gateway, including this spiffy profile model, a complete PC with no tower, no desktop box, a floppy, the CD-ROM, the speakers, the CPU, and all the ports are built into the flat screen monitor casing. There were three main application packages assembled by Schlumberger Sema, the overall IT integrator here at the Olympics. Info 2002, to provide information to athletes, journalists, and officials. The Commentator Information System, or CIS, to provide instantaneous output for live broadcasters. And the Games Management System, which handled a variety of tasks, including timing, scoring, and results. The Info 2002 system was designed to give any accredited Olympic person virtually instant information on almost any aspect of the Winter Games. The system was basically a huge intranet with access available at hundreds of kiosks located throughout the various Olympic venues. For example, if you were looking for event results, you could just click on the link for that event and you got to see which athletes had already been out in any of the 15 sports, from alpine skiing to speed skating. If you wanted to know what events were scheduled for a particular sport, just click on the schedules and you could see, for example, what the alpine skiing events were for the week. You could also do an instant check on the medal winners, look up the Olympic records for any particular sport, and even check all the results from the last Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. You could look into the history of any particular sport, like cross-country skiing, and even check out the weather forecasts for a particular venue. And all of this information was available in English and French. One of the major demands on the data network at the Olympics was to be absolutely sure it was always up and running. That meant a big emphasis on backups and layers of redundancy. We have A, B and C systems. Uh, we have C systems in the timing and scoring area. But for all our applications running on our servers, we tend to have an A server and a B server. Most of these servers are automatic failover, although some of our servers are manual, because you need to make sure that there's something up before it fails over. Not only was there redundancy in the network infrastructure, there was also backup for the data itself. We have two data centers. We have a primary data center where we all have our, where we have our Unix boxes, which is the main engines, uh, where we have a, a cluster which runs our info system. And in our primary data center, we have A systems and we have B systems. Now, just in case of a catastrophe, uh, we lose a primary data center, we actually have a secondary data center in another location. So if we lose an A system, a B system, and all the data, the primary data center, we have a standby data center, which basically brings us up a complete C system of everything. The Winter Olympics network was designed with what is called self-healing technology. Um, we have a, uh, a network supplied by uh, Quest, AT&T and Lucent. Uh, we have a Sonic network in the Salt Lake Valley, uh, which goes to our local area network. So a Sonic by its, only by its very nature is a self-healing system. So part of the, the um, wide area network was to go out through an ice storm, a flood or damage, or truck leaves the road and goes through some cables. Uh, the Sonic would reroute um, we have two shots going into each venue, so if one of, if one of the shots was to go down, we'd have a re another sh way of getting into the venue. The network also used technology from a network infrastructure company called Icono. The Icono built network, it's really a data network that takes advantage of uh, several levels of technology underneath, so to speak, to transport this data. And one key component of that is something called a sonnet ring provided by Quest. As you might guess, it's a ring of fiber that traverses throughout the state between Provo and Ogden. And um, uh, with, again, its own sonnet shelves, electronics that connects it all together. And um, it's actually several rings on one. And the reason they do that is the data circul circling around, whether it be our data or voice or video, there happens to be a break in there or some piece of electronics should actually die in that path. 
what the data would do is when it met that particular piece or location where the break occurred, it, it's, it's a self-healing network. It would turn around and go back the other way and circle all the way around to the original location it was intended to go. So with a self-healing feature, and it's very fast, it's within milliseconds, um, our data would not even notice. The other major information system here at the Olympics was designed specifically for TV commentators. It was called CIS, the Commentator Information System, and its specs were even more demanding than those for the info system, since the broadcasters needed results information in milliseconds so they could comment in real time on the events they were watching. The CIS system was built around touchscreen computers so that the announcers didn't have to fiddle around with keyboards or mice while they were talking live on the air. This was what the announcers who were covering freestyle skiing saw. This was for the aerial jump event, which involves both distance measurement and artistic ratings by judges. The commentators could check the current standings of all the skiers and look at the actual judges' scores. But doing scoring on an individual sport like skiing is easy compared to a complex team sport like ice hockey. At the hockey venues, the commentator could check out the team roster and coaches, look at an electronic scorecard, and see a summary of all goals, penalties, overall statistics for the teams, or for the individual players. And even a summary of the whole ice hockey tournament with information on all the teams involved. Since the real Olympics only happens once, the programmers here had to develop an Olympic Games simulator to feed dummy results into the system to see if it worked. This is the OVR, or On Venue Result System Simulator. It played simulated games and sent real-time data into the system. But while the engineers here could simulate the sports results, they couldn't simulate the human element, the actual demand on the network. And the network of people is the most complicated because the real high volume of people for that operation is only deployed during the games. You can simulate situations before, but in fact the, the hundreds and thousands of people that is working around technology during the games, it just happens during the games. The engineers here were not only simulating sports events and traffic loads, they also ran simulations on potential disaster scenarios. In these technical rehearsals, we have a technical rehearsal team, and this team stand to one side of the IT team, and what they do is they go away and they think of the nastiest things that could happen to us. They then sit down with the senior management of the organizing committee, and then do a whole host of scenarios which our team know nothing about. And what they do then is that during the technical rehearsal time, they will go around and they will literally pull a cable from a router. They will pull a pull a cable from an A system or a B system and our systems will go down and we go, oh goodness, what's happening? Testing the network and the software was just part of the preparation for the real games. The harder challenge was to test and train the people who would be using the systems. We cannot simulate the atmosphere, the pressure uh, of the media communications and so on. Uh, then we are simulating and training people. It's very important the, pro the training programs we have developed not just uh, trying to learn uh, how the software is working, that that's important, is what, how, which is the way to do when you have problems under a great pressure, uh, security, security measures are really important, uh, especially after September 11, and uh, training is the, at that moment, we are doing a big effort in that area. Now, where did all the real data come from that got fed into the CIS and info systems? First of all, the venues had to be wired and set up with laptops, which the system operators used to feed data into the network. This was the plan for the E-Center, where the hockey games were played. Okay, what we've got here is, in this area inside the E-Center is the results room. So all of our central servers and uh, I guess the central results machines will all be located within inside this room. As you can see here is the field of play, so we're very close to the ice hockey arena itself. Now if I flip to the other side, and give you a little show of what's inside the rink. Again, here we've got the field of play, so this is the rink, as you can see. In here is the scoring table, where the, it's called the officials box. Inside is the, an official scorer. There's two officials that control the, the official clock, penalties and goals. And we have one operator in here also that, that records in the result system goals, penalties, plus minus information, spectators, etc. 
up on this row, which they have a fairly good bird's eye view of the rink, there's 14 people. And these people are dedicated to watching the rink for assists, for plus minus. They also record shots for both sides, for both teams, in addition to face-offs and the results of what occurs for each one of those actions. These are the actual terminals that the official scores at the hockey games used for entering information about penalties, points scored, and the game clock. These laptops are what the operators used to enter the data about the game. It was then fed to the network and then distributed via the intranet to the TV networks, the CIS system, the scoreboards, and the internet. The input system for ice hockey was elaborate, providing every single detail of the game. The operator could enter data on every penalty, who got the penalty, and what kind of penalty it was. There was detailed information on every goal, not only who scored, but what players were on the ice at the time of the goal. There was a separate screen for tracking the goalie and changes of goalie during the game. And what's unique in Olympic hockey, game-winning shots, a shootout, if the score is still tied after two overtimes. The operator could also record all face-offs and indicate where on the ice they took place and who won. There was also a graphical system for recording all shots on goal. The operator selected the number of the player who shot the goal at the point on the ice where the shot was taken, and the code indicated the result of the shot, saved by goalie, saved by player, shot past goal, or goal. On a successful shot, the operator could even record where the puck hit the net. All this information was also fed immediately to the Olympics website, where you could have watched play-by-play -play action descriptions of each game. The application of computer technology at the Olympics went beyond just building a network and the IT infrastructure to support scoring, judging, and the media. In speed sports, where a hundredth of a second can mean the difference between a gold medal and no medal, Olympic athletes were looking for every possible technology advantage. And one of them was their clothing. So at the Utah Winter Olympics, for the first time ever, American speed skaters used a new high-tech outfit called the Nike Swift Skin Bodysuit, which can reduce friction by as much as 55%. Using the coated fabric on the hood, this is extremely fast. It actually helps to form a wing with the body. Being a horizontal position, the body and the hood almost act like a wing. So the textured fabric is perfect for this area. The Swift suit was designed using computer analysis of wind tunnel studies to create just the right fabric for each part of the skater's body. Again, the speed fabric on the hand, because the hand is moving very quickly and the small objects like to have this fast silver fabric. A start glove with some of the skaters who use a three-point stance to start, using a 3M material called Greptile, which helps them grip the ice, helps them keep their footing when they're doing the three-point stance. The Nike Swift suit actually consists of six separate fabrics, each used on the appropriate body part. And even the seams were designed to reduce friction. All we're trying to do is help them find out how fast they can go. But to do that, the suit has to fit as well as possible. But they have to be able to skate. They have to be able to go through the whole range of motion for skating uh, in order to skate fast. It's not just about aerodynamics. It's about freedom of movement. It's about lowering the friction between their legs and under their arms. So all that goes together, and all of it affects the fit of the suit. The Swift suit has been called the most technologically innovative piece of competitive sports apparel ever created. These, of course, were the first Olympics to be held after the September 11th terrorist attacks and the security was very very strict here barriers and fences everywhere very difficult to get around the Olympic area very difficult to get into any of the venues whether you were a visitor an athlete or even a journalist even getting into any of the computer centers of the Olympics was like boarding a series of airplanes endless searches and bag checks and even at the usually cozy Olympic Village there were electronic fences and concrete barriers and with over 6,000 computers moving in and out of the 11 different venues, they had to be checked every time they moved, just like your laptop at the airport. Each and every computer box moving from the PC factory to the venues had to be x-rayed to make sure it really was just a computer. Concerns for security also affected the technology used inside the PC factory. When they first started the operation here, they were using a wireless network. But after September 11th, that all changed. 
that was very convenient for us at some time uh, at some time because we need a lot of mobility around the, around the warehouse we uh, continuously need to read the barcodes with the serial numbers and the types of the systems that are in this warehouse so we installed for some time uh, wireless access but uh, now it is a security critical time so we had to disconnect that system and we are relying only on copper wire to access to the network we, we do not use wireless technology here in Solde and the reason we've done that is that we don't feel that the security or the bandwidth which are used by wireless technologies gives us what we want now. Now, for Athens and Torino, that may be different when we have the next generation of wireless technology. But we feel, although it's out there and everyone thinks it's um, sort of leading edge technology and you should use it, we look at this leading edge technology and our security people look at it and we look at it for performance. We go, interesting, not now, maybe later. There was also concern that after the software images were installed on the computers here at the PC factory, viruses could be introduced into the computers after they left this location. So procedures had to be developed to prevent that. Once the images are installed on the systems, uh, every system uh, is blocked. Uh, let's say the BIOS of the system is blocked so that they cannot introduce any uh, foreign material into the machine. Uh, the floppy disks and the CD-ROMs, uh, ROM drives, are blocked, uh, are locked, let's say, so that they can't read anything, any extraneous material into the, the machine. While physical security was one of the biggest concerns at the Winter Olympics, for the techies here in Salt Lake City, they were most worried about data and network security. Network security is one of the biggest focuses we have right now. Um, with all of the events in the world, with the way the the online community is going, we have spent a great deal of time and resources in preparing for the Olympics for such things. We, we obviously have a solid intrusion detection system. We have response teams in place. There's a lot of technology that's put in place to keep the, the game secure. Security at the Olympics also meant making sure that all the athletes followed the rules. Here in the Olympic Village, there were specialized computer systems for athlete accreditation and qualification. Each athlete's data was entered into the database to make sure he or she was authorized by their respective national Olympic committees and met the qualifications for participating in that particular sport. As in many business systems, much of the information on the athletes started out on paper, but then had to be entered into what was called the SEQ, the Sports Entry Qualification System. The Sports Entry and Qualification System is used to validate the rules or the Federation and IOC rules of the athletes. In other words, their competition rules. For example, NOCs are allowed a certain number of participants per competition, NOC being National Olympic Committee. This system will validate that. There are certain criteria that each athlete must meet to be able to participate in the Olympics. This helps validate that. With everyone so security conscious, accreditation of not only athletes, but anyone who was working at the Olympic site was a mission critical task. Using software systems that incorporated digital photographs, barcodes, and holograms. With hundreds of millions of dollars of IT infrastructure created just for these games, which only lasted for a little more than two weeks, what happens to all of this now that the Winter Olympics are over? The infrastructure is disbanded. The knowledge in people will move on from games to games. So as Schlumberger Sema, we will capture all of the information, all of the knowledge and expertise that we learn in Salt Lake and we'll move to Athens, which we already have a team in place. We'll also move to Turin and the next Olympic Games. The, the, the idea is that for uh, Torino, where I go two months after the Games here, is we will take everything, lock, stock and barrel in this case, and all we, what we will do then is that we will sit down with the uh, Torino committee and we will go through the look and feel um, changes they need to make. Obviously the Salt Lake Games look and feel is different to what the Torino committee do. We have to sit down with the sports federations and go through a series of what we call ORIS meetings where we sit down with the sports federations and the IOC and we really look at all the rules and regulations and have to make modifications. So we see the majority of what we hear going over and then we will have to top and tail to suit. And what happens to the nearly 7,000 computers that Gateway provided for the Olympics? They're being donated to schools around the country. 
One of the amazing things about the IT systems developed for the Olympics was that the work was all done essentially for nothing. In fact, several major IT companies bid for the right to more or less give away their technology. And they did it not only for the publicity, but for what they learned in the process. Well, in fact, it's not for nothing. The technologies we have used, especially in the case of uh, uh, managing the databases for accreditations or the info, or specifically the CIS, the, Conf the Commentators Information Systems, we have used one kind of technology that uh, uh, we will reuse in another project. It's really a high level of technology that can be used in the several areas. In fact, uh, for our company also, we are innovating. We, have, we, have, we are using that opportunity for innovation as well. Many of the techies working on the IT systems for the Olympics came to this assignment from more mundane corporate IT environments, where implementing a new IT system usually means a phased process of bringing up one new system at a time. But that was not an option here at the Olympics. It's very much different. It's almost an upside-down scenario, if you will. We spend three years of testing, preparation, validation for 17 days of production. When we start in production, we don't get the chance to make a fix. If it doesn't work out of the gate, it's going to fail. In a typical corporate scenario, you're going to throw something into production, and you're going to make fine-tune, you're going to make adjustments to that as time goes on to enhance the system, to fix bugs, fix defects. We don't have that opportunity. Every engineer and technician we talked to here at the Olympics said that this was the assignment of a lifetime, a great technical challenge and a great life adventure. So how do you get a job like this? One night I was sitting at home at about 11 o'clock and I was cruising the internet and I saw Monster.com and saw a regional venue manager wanted for the Olympics and I was, oh, that sounds like a fun job. I just got excited about doing that job. So I put about 10 minutes into writing a cover letter and I faxed in my resume and the next morning about 9 o'clock I got a phone call from them saying that uh, it looked like my resume had what they were looking for and they wanted me to get down there. And within two weeks I was working. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffe at the Winter Olympics in Utah. Computer Chronicles is brought to you by the Oracle Small Business Suite one completely integrated application that helps make it easier to run your business, including accounting, sales and service, your web presence, and more. Additional funding is provided by pc to pc the online migration service from PC First, moving files, applications, and preferences from your old computer to your new one.